Well, good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here. We're going to kick off a brand new series this morning. Uh, we're calling it Easter Hidden in Plain Sight. Now, it's going to make a little bit more sense after today about why it is that title. Um, but if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them up to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Okay. While you're turning there, just honest show of hands, how many of you have ever had that Easter egg that you just couldn't find? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you, you all know the process, right? The night before you dye the eggs. Um, if you're like me, you meticulously count out how many eggs there are. There are a dozen eggs that are there. You leave them out. The Easter Bunny then hides them in the middle of the night. And the next morning, if you're lucky, you've gotten to 10. If you're really lucky, you've gotten to 11. And you're like, then you're hunting as an adult with the kids to figure out where in the world did that Easter Bunny put the last Easter egg, right? It doesn't matter how easy the Easter Bunny might have thought that they were hiding it the night before. There's always that one egg. And at some point, right, at some point you're like, honey, did we really do 12 eggs last night? Or did we maybe, like, did we maybe miscount? Like, is it possible that we did 11 or you look over at the dog and you're like, did we make one of those eggs too easy to find, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, and when you have 12, like losing one, you're like, how in the world? How in the world is it possible? Like that margin of error is like not very good. But like if you hide a hundred eggs, like losing two eggs in a hundred, you're like, we did good, right? Like there's this, this moment of like pride that we got like really close in all of this sort of thing. And maybe a hundred's a lot to count. So maybe there were really only 98 that we put out to begin with. It also matters whether the egg is a real egg or a plastic egg, right? The real egg you hunt a little bit harder for <laughs> because you know in a few days you're gonna find that real egg. Yeah, I know. A few years ago, well, not a few years ago, a lot of years ago, I'm getting old now. Um, I was hunting Easter eggs at my Aunt Sylvia's house, and uh, I got one more egg than what I was supposed to get that year. Every kid, we had a, a number that we were supposed to hit, and I was one over. And I had this one egg that looked a little bit different than the other eggs. Now, it was an annual thing that we went and hunted Easter eggs at my Aunt Sylvia's house. We would hide them across her front lawn. They were everywhere. There were all of us cousins and grandkids, everybody there. There was a whole bunch of us. And so she had this big expansive lawn that was fun to do. We'd have a big Easter dinner there um, and all of us would, would hang out. And I remember as I um, began to open up my plastic Easter eggs to inspect the prizes that were inside because let's be honest, that's what Easter is all about. Right, kids? Yes. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. I got a yes from Maddie over there. I appreciate that as well. Um, yeah. So I'm inspecting, inspecting all of them and I got to the last egg and the last egg, well, it looked a little bit different than all the others. The color on the outside of the plastic wasn't quite as vibrant as all of the others had been. And I cracked open the egg and this black ooze came out from inside and sloshing around in the black ooze was this wrapper and a little bit of candy that floated out. I had found the egg from last year that nobody had found. Now, I suppose if that had been the lucky egg that had coins in it, it would not have been quite so bad. But instead, no, it was a candied egg and it was no longer worth anything at, at this point. But what had seemed so hard to find the year before obviously had not been that hard to find this year because I'd had no trouble finding it in all of the fury of everything. Well, our story today is sort of like that Easter egg story, minus the black sludge, all right? Luke 24 is the final chapter of Luke. And uh, so Luke is kind of, he's gone from the very beginning. He's traced the, the birth narrative of Jesus. Actually, he starts a little bit before that. Um, he has the, the birth of a guy named John the Baptist, which is um, Jesus's cousin. And so he starts there and he's traced all the way through to the death of Jesus. And Luke 
chapter 24 opens up and we hear the most incredible of news. In fact, it seems almost unbelievable. The women have shown up at the tomb and they have left from there and they come back and tell the disciples that they have seen an angel. And the angel has told them that Jesus was no longer dead and has risen from the grave. And they looked inside of the tomb and it was empty. He was not there. And they have now come back and they have told this story to the disciples. And I love what verse 11 says because I think this is kind of what all of us would be thinking in this moment. Verse 11 of chapter 24 says this. But these words seem to them an idle tale. And they didn't believe them. And that's the backdrop that we're going to find this next story in. And this next story is about two men, two disciples. One's name was Cleopas. The other one is unnamed in the Bible. Lots of different guesses about who it might have been. But these two men, after all of the events that have taken place, are headed back to their home village And they're on the road to a place called Emmaus. I remember it like it was yesterday. You don't even know what you had for lunch yesterday. I do too. I had... Why don't you tell the story? All right, I'll tell the story. Oh, I hate the way you tell the story. I'll tell the story. So there we were. It was the worst weekend of our life. Jesus had been crucified. He'd been placed in the tomb. And we were all in the upper room, and we were very, very scared. Oh, very scared and very nervous. Nervous as a pair of long-tailed cats in a room full of rockers. Now, just to clarify, there were no cats and there were no rocking chairs. I was speaking metaphorically. Well, you need to be more clear. I, I need you to be more clear. So anyway, it was chaos inside and then there was chaos outside. And it was Mary, and she was off in the distance, and she was yelling frantically. Yes, and then the doors bust open, and she's shouting at the top of her lungs, He's alive! He's alive! Now, Mary... Sweet Mary, uh, salt of the earth. Salt of the earth, that woman. But sometimes she gets... Well, she just gets a little confused. To say the least, I remember I said to you, I bet she went to the wrong tomb. (laughs) It was just such chaos, and so we decided that we'd go back to our homes. Right. So we started back home. It's about a seven-mile walk on the road to Emmaus. And we're walking and talking. Talking and walking. Then all of a sudden, this man comes up behind us. Yes, I remember. He looked at us, and he said, um, he said, why the long faces? And I looked at him, and I said, that's just how we're made. We can't help it, and if you do not like it... The man was speaking metaphorically. Well, I needed him just to be clear. He wasn't clear. We said to him... uh, Oh, well, I said to him, I said, are you the only person in Jerusalem that hasn't heard just what has happened? Right, and I said to him, uh, Jesus had been crucified, we placed him in the tomb, now we can't find his body. And I went on to say we were just horribly disappointed because we thought Jesus was the one. And he says, uh, why are your head's so thick. Why, why are your heart so slow? And I looked at him right in the eye and I said, we're just getting older. We cannot help it. There's nothing we the can... The man was speaking metaphorically. I just needed him to be clear. Then he looked at us and he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and all through the prophets and explain to us how the scriptures said this would happen to the Messiah. It was wonderful. (laughs) It was amazing. We came to a fork in the road. Just to be clear, it wasn't a literal fork. We came to a spot where the road divided Mm -hmm. and I invited him to join us for dinner. 
I think he said yes because I told him my wife was making a cobbler. She makes a great cobbler. That woman can cobble. So we get here and we sit down for dinner. And he blessed the meal and he broke the bread. And then... I looked at you. And I looked at you. And we knew our hearts, they were burning inside of us. We were sitting with the Messiah. We, we were sitting at the table with the risen Savior. And then both of us, we, um, we turned to face him and, um, he was gone. Vanished. I never get tired of telling that story. <laughs> I may not remember what I had for lunch, but I'll never forget that story. Tell that story. Well, aren't you a regular Bobby Fisher? <laughs> king me. I'm not going to king you. King me. I'm not going to king you. No, king me. No, king. That's a good story. I'm not going to tell that story. Add that no. one to your book. That's a good story. What, the story of an old man who cheats at checkers to feel better about himself? You're not clarifying that at all. I just won. Look at right there. That's oh, a yeah. winner right there. That's a good story. That oh. would be the title of the book, The Winner. You are a winner. I am a winner. Look I'm what... speaking metaphorically. Well, why don't you keep you in the Oh, man. Okay, I'm a fan of those two guys. If you don't know who they are, they're the skit guys. But could you imagine being those two guys in history, right? Could you imagine being some of the first people who got to see and talk with the risen Savior? Man, these guys, they, they doubted what the women had said to them earlier. Um, and, and they were kind of like all guys are, right? I mean, if you... Um, if you talk to a guy after the Super Bowl, they're fixated on the Super Bowl and they're gonna talk about what the coach should have done, he should have done this, he should have done that, he, he could have made this change and, and they're gonna be dissecting all of the things and, and they get really kind of focused in on all of this stuff. It, listen, ladies, let me just give you a clue. This is just sort of how us guys work, all right? We get kind of fixated on, on things. And so when the Bible talks about the fact that um, they were blind, now ladies, don't hit or hate on your husbands right here. Don't nudge them about the fact that they were blind to this sort of a thing. I understand that you guys see everything, um, but guys, let me just help you out for a second, all right? Because it has been medically proven, all right, that there's a difference between mommy eyes and daddy eyes. Now at my house, sometimes my wife will say, did you look with my eyes or did you look with your eyes? Anybody else have that ever said to them in their house? Yeah, my daughter's raising her hand. She's like, yeah, my mom said that to me too. Yeah, actually science has proven why this is, right? That we were, were designed, guys were designed to be hunters and they were designed to look at things from far off, like up on a cliff or to be able to see what it was that they were targeting at versus a woman was designed to be a gatherer. All right, and so she was designed to inspect the berries up close to see exactly what they were and to make sure that they were good for you. So the ability to see something close and in detail is her skill. The ability to see something from far off is our skill, guys. All right, that, that's why it's just like that. So if you don't have enough room in your pantry, guys, for you to back up about 20 feet to look at the pantry, it's not your fault, right? And so when she says, did you look at it with my eyes? She'd be like, God didn't make me that way, honey. So you need to help me out just a little bit. But here it was, these two guys, they, um, they were looking at it like this. They were looking at everything up close, all the details of all the stuff. And Jesus comes up alongside of them. Um, and, and he says to them, he says, well, I, let's just read it. Verse 25 and 26 of chapter 24, he says this. He says, oh, foolish ones. Okay, ladies, I know you've said that a couple of times to your husbands whenever they can't see something too. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ Messiah would suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and then all of the prophets, 
he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. I love it. Jesus says to these guys, hey, listen, guys, you're blind because you're looking at all of the small details and not the big picture, right? What you need, guys, is you need the puzzle box to help you to see the bigger picture and not just staring at the individual puzzle pieces. We would never know what this puzzle is supposed to look like just looking at these tiny puzzle pieces. A couple of weeks ago, my family was putting together a puzzle. My wife loves puzzles. By the way, it's her birthday today and I'm about to get in a whole lot of trouble because I'm gonna put this picture up on the screen Her doing puzzles in my house. Terry's being nice. Oh, there it is. It's actually the puzzle that's in this box. Um, I got in trouble because I broke the puzzle. Um, it happens. But here's, here's what happened. We, we began to put this DIY puzzle together and it had the, the map of everything that we needed of what it was. And usually when you put a puzzle together, I don't know about you, but I work on the outside frame first, right? I put the frame in and then do it all. And as we built the frame, we learned that there were some pieces that could go in more than one spot. The frame is just some like solid colors with a little bit of gradient all the way around it. And it could go here and it could go here and it could go. There were multiple places on the frame that it could go. And so we had to quit working on the frame of the puzzle. Instead, we had to move. I think you, maybe you can see it from where you're at. If not, it's up on the, on the screen. But we had to begin working on some of these phrases, these quotes that were there because we could see the lines and the, the pieces that were to go, to get, go together. It was like, I can change the world. And so we would put that piece together because we could find all the things to make that quote. And then we would find all the pieces for the butterfly and we began to put the image of the, the butterfly together. And as we did it, we began to put the middle of the whole thing together because we had the quotes and the images. And then when we got those, we were able to build the framework of the whole thing together. Now, thankfully this wasn't one of those like satanic puzzles that has no edge. <laughs> Lord help the person who ever created that. But here it was, Jesus is saying to these guys, he's saying, listen, why are you puzzled. He says that the whole Old Testament has images and quotations about me. And this should have given you the framework for everything that you needed to understand about what it is that's taken place. Jesus stops and he basically goes back and he says to them, the whole Old Testament is about me. Oh, wait, 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 Pastor Charles. You mean the New Testament is about Jesus, right? Because, I mean, that's where we find the story of his birth and his life and his death. The New Testament, that's what you mean. Don't confuse me, Pastor Charles. No, no, no. Jesus is not talking about the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about what Moses wrote. He's talking about what the prophets said. He's talking about the, the writings. We're going to get into that in just a second. But, Pastor Charles, the Old Testament, the Old Testament, that's a picture of of a God who is angry and wrathful and like, you know, like bad things happen in the Old Testament. And Jesus, Jesus is like God of love. And like, these two things don't mix. No, I'm telling you, Jesus said that the whole Old Testament is about him. You're like, maybe right here. Hang on, hang on. Just a few verses later, on down, another story. He shows up to a different group of disciples. Verse 44, he says, these are my words. This is Jesus talking, that I spoke to you while I was still with you so that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms would be fulfilled. Then later on in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is quoted in the book of Hebrews, and here's what he says. He says, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as it was written in, of me in the scroll of the book. Listen, the New Testament 
was still being formed at this point. There was no scroll. There was no book that was going on. Jesus is talking about the Old Testament right here. And I, I love this. I know we're talking a little bit about Easter eggs. Jesus drops an Easter egg in John chapter 5. He says this, verse 39. He says, you, he's talking to all of the people that were there. You search the scriptures because you think that in, in them, in the scriptures, you'll find eternal life. And then he says, but it is the scriptures that bear witness about me. And if you skip on down to verse 46, he says this to those that were there. He says, listen, if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me because Moses wrote about me. So Jesus was pretty clear. He was pretty clear that the entire Old Testament was all about him. But then he begins to take them on a tour. Like, you know, I think about the song like Gilligan's Island, right? You know, it just starts humming in my head. I'm not going to sing it. I've, I've broken way too many live streams when I sang in here. So, but here it was, they were on just a three mile tour, actually seven miles. By the way, a seven mile journey is approximately a half day's journey. It's about how long it would have taken them to walk the seven miles to get there. My family, well, my family, my wife and I have been watching 1883. Have any of you guys watched 1883? Oh my goodness. I've decided that I would have died. I would, have, I would not have made it to Oregon. I'm not even sure I would have made it out of the state of Texas. Those, the, I was, it's just incredible. And what I went and looked up, I was like, how far did they make it every day as they were traveling on stuff? How far would, would it go? And the CDC says this, it says a brisk walking pace is two and a half to three miles an hour. That's a brief, a brisk walking pace. So these guys who are about to go seven miles, right? The fastest that they could have done it would have been about two to two and a half hours. But they're guys, let's just be honest. So it was probably a half day journey for them. And that half day, and that half day, they got to listen to Jesus unfold the entire Old Testament. And to go through and to point out these moments, right, that were in the Old Testament, starting with Moses, right? Which I, so I didn't make this drawing. Um, that's probably good because I mean, you know, but the Old Testament for, for the Jews is called this, the Tanakh, right? And it's about three different sections that exist inside of the Old Testament. There's the Torah, which is the books of Moses. So when he says that Moses, that he started with Moses, he's talking about, he started with the books of Moses, right? The first five books. And then when he says he moved on to the prophets, he's talking about the Nevi'im, right? That's that middle section of stuff that is put together. And then Later on in verse 44, where he's talking to the, the other set of disciples, we see that he also talks about Psalms, which he's saying, listen, I'm also in the writings or the Ketuvim, right? Which is where they get the name of the Tanakh. It comes from Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. And so we, we have all of those. It's those three abbreviations put together. Now, I don't know exactly what Jesus said to them. I wish I did. Some of you probably wish that you did too. I mean, that would be so amazing to have Jesus walk through all of scripture, pointing out the moment that you're going, listen, this was about me. This moment right here is about me. Now there's two different things that he could have been pointing out. The first one is he could have been pointing out those direct quotations, those prophecies that exist inside of the Old Testament, right? Those direct quotations of who the Messiah, who the Christ is supposed to be. And things like this, that Genesis 49.10 says that he would be from the tribe of Judah. Or 2 Samuel 7.12, it says this, that he would receive King David's throne. Isaiah chapter 50 says that he'd be spat upon and beaten Isaiah 53 says that he'd be silent in the face of accusations. Hosea 11, some of you ladies went through Hosea. It says that he would spend a season in Egypt. And then Zechariah chapter nine says that he would ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. 
That's just some of the prophecies. In fact, there are over 300 direct prophecies related about the Messiah. Perhaps one of my favorite thoughts comes from a a book by a guy named Peter Stoner. He wrote a book called Science Speaks. And in that book, he calculated, he said, listen, the chance of any man fulfilling any, any one singular of these prophecies is, I don't know what that number is. (laughs) It's 10 to the 17th power. There are 17 zeros there, one and 10 to the 17th power. That's just for him to fulfill one of those things. But he took it a little bit further and he said, listen, if a man was to fulfill eight of these prophecies, 300 of them, if he was to fulfill eight of them, the odds are equivalent to 10 to the 28th power. And then he built this illustration to help us sort of visually understand the staggering odds that it would be of just eight, okay? He said, listen, take the state of Texas. Man, Texas is getting a lot of love today. Oh man, I'll pray for you. (laughs) My wife is wearing burnt orange Texas colors today. It hurts my Oklahoma State heart. She's supposed to know that bright orange is the only kind of orange allowed in my house. Anyways, Dr. Stoner said this. He said that if you took the state of Texas and you were to put silver dollars and fill the entire state of Texas two feet deep, okay, that would be equivalent to the 10 to the 28th power of silver dollars. And if you took and marked just one of those and then allowed a man, now he says blindfolded to walk out there and to pick up that thing. Listen, he doesn't even be blindfolded. Just the first one that you pick up has to be the one that is marked. That's the statistical odds of eight. Dr. Stoner went one step further. He said, listen, if you were to fulfill 32 of these, it's 10 to the 57th power. And if you're going to talk about all 300 of these being fulfilled, it becomes virtually incalculable the odds. But here it was, Jesus walking through, telling these guys, and he very well could have been going through all of these prophecies saying, see, this prophecy was about the Messiah and about the things that were going to happen, all 300 of them that were fulfilled by the Messiah. And you know what? There's a strong likelihood that he did some of that. He may not have gone through all 300 of them, but as we read the gospels and the things that the disciples wrote, they help us by making these direct connections of the fulfillment of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. The only way they're going to know that is because Jesus taught it to them. And the revelation of the Holy Spirit afterwards. And so I think there's a strong possibility that that's some of the things that he walked through. But there's a second thing that he did, not only direct quotes, kind of like our puzzle that we did, not only direct quotes, but there were images in the Old Testament. In fact, actually what we call them is we call them types and shadows. Types and shadows. Now that's a, a fitting way to describe Christ in the Old Testament because a, a shadow... A shadow provides this sort of idea of what something looks like without completely revealing it, right? We, we know that. That's why kids get scared of shadows at night because they're not exactly sure what it is and, and their brain just tells them it could be any of these number of things. And then when, when we track what the shadow is reflecting, they go, oh, it's just a tree. Oh, it's just a car. Oh, it's just, you know, whatever it was. But a shadow, it just provides this sort of idea about what it is without completely revealing the object. But what I love is, is that a shadow is without doubt, without a doubt, it's evidence that something is casting it. A shadow cannot exist unless something is casting that shadow. Or in the case of Christ, not just something, someone. Finally, I love this about shadows. Nobody looks at a shadow and says, oh, that shadow is a real thing, right? Nobody sees the shadow of a tree or a car and thinks that's a tree or a car. We understand that it's a a shadow because shadows don't have any sort of real substance to them. They're not reality. 
Well, the Old Testament does this with Christ. There are shadows of Christ and the Easter event hidden throughout the Old Testament. I love what Colossians says. It says this. It says the festival or a new moon or the Sabbaths are all shadows of things to come. They are the substance that is of Christ. In other words, just like a shadow points to a real object, Jesus is the substance that the, these are all pointing to. They're the real object of what it is. And again, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says this. It says, The law was only a shadow of the good things that were to come instead of the true form of these realities. See, Jesus was and is the reality of all of these things that were being pointed to. He is the reality of them. It's almost as if God sort of like placed these Easter eggs, right, throughout all of the Old Testament for us to find. Uh, and that's exactly what the rest of this series is, is going to do, is we're going to find and unpack, um, hopefully without any of the black sludge attached to it, all of these different Easter eggs. And maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this. And if you didn't, then I'm going to give you something interesting right now. At least I hope, I thought it was interesting. But in the movies, oftentimes directors will include a hidden something inside of their movies. Oftentimes they're um, a, a wink and a nod at their fans about um, things that they should know about. Maybe they're dropping hints about a, a future movie or a past movie or something that they've done. Um, now, what's interesting is, the, the name Easter eggs inside of movies, um, most people think that it came from uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I didn't know this until I was Googling it, but the story goes like this, that in 1975, when the cast was shooting um, the movie, um, that they had an Easter egg hunt on site. That'd be pretty interesting, right? Like here it is, whole cast and all their families came and did uh, an Easter egg hunt. Um, but like any good Easter egg hunt, not all the eggs were found. <laughs> and Pace Magazine says this, as a result, there are three known Easter eggs, literal eggs that made the final cut in the movie. And they are hidden in plain sight. Now, some of you are like, what? You're like, I'm going to go home and uh, listen, I'm going to show you one of them. I'm just going to show you one of them to just prove it. All right. Here's one just for fun. You see the egg underneath his chair circled right there, hiding in plain sight. One of the Easter eggs that did not get found. You can go look for the other two if you want. Um, so pretty neat little thing. So here it was, this concept right? I love it, but it's not new to film directors. God had placed Easter eggs in the Bible long, long ago, and they were there waiting to be unpacked. And over the next five weeks, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to see some of them. We're not going to see all of them, but we're going to take some of them, and we're going to unpack them and show how some of these shadows, some of these types, some of these images that existed in the Old Testament pointed to the Easter event and everything that had to happen and take place. I love how Scott LaPierre says this. You've got to say his name like that, right? LaPierre. He describes it like this. He says, the Old Testament is a treasure hunt pointing and guiding us directly to Jesus. So Jesus is the treasure. And here it is. We're going to unearth some fun gems over the next few weeks. Let me just challenge you. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, you know what? I don't know what I think about Jesus yet, but I'm sitting here in this room. Let me just challenge you to come back. Because one of the things that gets put about Jesus is as well, they changed his story afterwards to make it more important. Listen, these Easter eggs that we're going to see were hundreds of years prior and the people who got the gospel were contemporaries. They lived with Jesus. And if there were things that were wrong, they'd have been very quick to, to have been like, nope, this is off. And it would have been squashed right away. And so I love that God hid these things. He placed them very intentionally. 
to help to prove that Jesus was and is the Messiah. So come back next week. Next week, we're going to kick off with the tree of life, right? Scene in the garden. The very first scene that we see inside of the Bible, outside of the moment of creation where everything's being put into place. And there's the tree of life that is there. And we're going to see how the tree of life is a shadow of the Easter event. And I love that it was there even before Adam and Eve sinned. God had a plan. And God knew it was going to happen before it ever did. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you as we get ready to kick off this series. God, I'm looking forward to it as we just tear apart your word. And to see these images that you've placed, these Easter eggs, to help us to understand the reality of the moment of the cross the empty tomb and the eternity and incredible gift of life that you give God I just pray right now maybe there's somebody sitting here and they're like you know what I'm ready to taste and to see I'm ready to check out this Jesus thing God I pray that they would lean in And if they're ready to say yes right now before we've even unpacked all of this, then God, that they would just at the back of the room find me and say, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready today. God, I'd love to see you do that work. Because I know that you're in the business of changing lives. And you've been planning and changing things from the very beginning. All for my good. All for our good all because you're good. God, we just give you all the glory and the honor in your name. Amen.